with Zone Haven. And this is kind of the newest technology in evacuation planning. So stay tuned for more information on that uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll use many sources, obviously, to share emergency information. AC Alert is our number one tool. This is, we're able to send voice, text, and email through AC Alert when it comes to life-threatening uh, uh, issues or disasters or events. The other is we want everyone to sign up for the new EverBridge app, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But I can tell you the difference between the app and the AC Alert homepage is the app will give you all of the I'll call it the non-essential or non-life-saving things uh, that you want to know, traffic alerts, um, uh, or, hey, it's red flag. We can't send that on AC Alert, but we can send it through the Everbridge app now. Uh, WIA, or Wireless Emergency Alerts, that is uh, sent out by the county at this point, um, and they broadcast on your cell phones. It's like an Amber Alert. Uh, we also work with the county to do TV and radio interrupts you know, with the emergency information scrolled at the bottom. Uh, we have the radio 1610 and Measure FF is providing us funds to uh, bring in an outdoor warning system. And that's what we're working on right now as well. This is a new technology that is much more effective than the old siren systems that are kind of left over from uh, <laughs> the war era. Uh, but it is an outdoor warning system, not all uh, the tones or the voice commands that come out of it will be able to be heard indoors. So if you hear it, it's supposed to give you an idea to tune into somewhere else for information. And we'll campaign this once we get all the uh, uh, system in and around. This is going to take a little bit because it's a <laughs> it's a huge project, but it might, I'm hoping within a year, year and a half, we'll have it we'll have it settled in. Um, so it, like I said, this is just a series of sirens with PA capabilities positioned throughout the city and we'll work to get your attention to turn to one of the other systems for more information. Um, so the next slide I wanna do is uh, play just the first two minutes of some raw video from the 1991 Hills Fire. Just a moment to hook that up. Okay, so just wanted to give you a little bit of that historical value as we move forward. You know, um, and I'll ask for the next slide once you get that ready. But our challenge still remains. 
people ask, what's our evacuation plan? We can talk about the evacuation plan all day <laughs> and I can show you documents, but really it's about, we're going to do everything in our power to get everyone in danger off the hill and out of harm's way to and to communicate with you. However, with that being said, for these fast moving fires or the Diablo wind driven fires, in the conditions we're seeing everywhere else, we know it's not gonna be enough. It's a math equation that we can't solve. The roads are too small, the spread is too big for everyone to drive out ahead of a fast moving fire. You saw that in the video, people were running, stalled cars, uh, cars on fire. This is a huge issue. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at this slide, you may ask, why is this good news? Well, because I can tell you, these catastrophic fires are predictable, they happen in predictable conditions. It's, they are what we call a fire uh, weather phenomena, just like a hurricane or a tornado. I am confident red flag conditions minus the wind driven fire, a grass fire occurs with all the good vegetation management that is being done in the county and the, and the, the city, your homes, and we want that to continue. I feel confident we can kind of control that environment versus the wind driven fire. That's one we can't control. That's like asking a fire engine to go out and stop a tornado. You can put all the fire engines, fire crews in front of a tornado or hurricane, and it's going to happen anyway because it's a phenomenon. These are wind-driven fires. They're happening during extreme fire weather conditions. So recall from the earlier slide, in 2020, we only got two days out of the entire year that were extreme. We were anxious. We had our EOC uh, activated and just monitoring the, the conditions. If a, if a fire started, we knew we had to be on it right away. So part of our charge to you is to consider what you can do to be out of harm's way during these very specific and predictable conditions. A total of 44 people died in 2017 California fires all happening in the purple zone there. 86 in the 2018 campfire, all happening in the extreme weather conditions that you see on the slide. Obviously we know 25 people in the 91 Hills fire died. Next slide, please. So when will you decide to leave? So I encourage you to find your own trigger point. Traditionally, People leave when they consider, or they consider leaving after a fire has started and the evacuation order has been sent. But we're realizing that we have more options than waiting until that fire starts. Preemptive relocation. To the left of the fire icon that you see here on the slide, we are showing red flag warning, extreme fire where the warnings. This is what we're calling preemptive relocation. And during any extreme weather, event, we will message out, consider preemptive relocation if you can. This is where you control most of your own destiny. What you can see is that you will have a lot more time on the left side, red flag warning, extreme, and options if you leave before a fire starts. Once a fire starts, a lot more of the circumstances will be left to chance and a lot more decisions will be out of your hands. Next slide, please. So we encourage you to make a plan for evacuation, starting with what your trigger point is, preemptive relocation. If you have family members out of the area on the flats or in a different city, uh, friends that you can stay with. Uh, last year, we uh, offered hotel vouchers and where the hotels that, because they were empty sort of during COVID, they were giving discounts to community members who wanted to preemptive relocate out of the hills and down to the flats. And I think there were at least 290 rooms taken during those times that they offered that voucher. And we'll continually try to partner with those uh, hotels in our area that we can to let that happen again. You should consider each member of your household, including your pets, what's right for one person may not be right for the others. Um, so keep in mind that Household members who wait to leave until a fire starts will need to be ready to walk out. 
if the roads get blocked by other cars or fire overruns you, you have to be able to get out somehow. Contri consider preemptive relocation. Next slide, please. Sign up uh, your mobile phone and email address for AC Alert. Starting this year, you will need you will need to download the Everbridge app to your phone in order to get red flag alerts and other uh, what we call lower level messages. You can find the app on your I iPhones or uh, Android devices and associate it with your AC Alert account to get messages on your phone. If you do a search, you plug in Alameda County, it'll tell you on the Everbridge app, this is your county, and you go ahead and sign up that way. Next, uh, next slide, please. So be ready to receive information. We will use Twitter accounts. Uh, if you're not a Twitter user, you can definitely sign up for those, follow the City of Berkeley account, as well as the AC Alert account or Alameda County Alert account, which will duplicate all of the AC Alert messages that we're sending out or the county is send it, sending out, it'll duplicate on the Twitter account. Obviously, Zone Haven, you can bookmark that when, you, when the, we send out that uh, URL. You can bookmark the page so you're ready to see what is in your district or your zone and be prepared. Uh, here are some radio stations. Uh, these stations will offer emergency information as well. Next slide, please. This slide is just saying, take extra precautions during a fire, uh, during fire weather. Most fires start, uh, uh, are started because of human factors. We're talking burning debris, vehicle fires, equipment use, arson, campfires, people playing with fires, and believe it or not, people smoking. <laughs> That's still one of the issues. So again, sign up for the alerts and be ready to receive the information. And if I can encourage you on, if you have your phones by your bedside, and sometimes a lot of people turn their phones off at night, maybe during red flag weather, leave your phone by your bed and leave it on because that's how we're gonna, our first attempt is gonna get you on your phone. So next slide. And I wanted to um, leave this up on the screen a little bit. Oh, we have a little malfunction there, but I wanted to leave this on the screen a little bit. So we have a little bit of time for a few questions that were sent in. Uh, so give me just a moment, find my glasses. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer a couple of the questions that have come in. Uh, does the city coordinate with our public utilities companies to ensure that the roads are kept clear on red flag days when utilities have public works construction going on? The short answer is yes. All red flag days, we coordinate with our surrounding agencies, our partners, our contractors, and we have gone the extra step that on red flag days, not only do we hoist the flags around the, the city, uh, the signs on the fire stations, the, sign, the flags on city buildings and fire stations, um, we also say there is no hot work. So no you know, um, uh, welding or, or work anything in the city or from our contractors that could create a spark. We don't do these things on red flag days. And we email this out to our internal group partners and also our external group. So even the, our neighboring cities know what we're doing. Uh, another question, uh, what specific protocols are in place for emergency public communication? Who serves as central command and which outlets are most reliable? Well, let's see, <laughs> central command, I guess that's us. That's the Office of Emergency Services. We notify the community when there are life safety issues, um, and or some protective actions needs to be given. Uh, we partner also with our city public information officer uh, that will push out uh, emergency communications on several different platforms in an effort to reach everyone. City's webpage, AC Alert, the app, Nixle, the radio, Twitter, Nextdoor, and soon to be outdoor warning system during emergencies. Uh, let's see. Uh, Please address the substantial risk of fire created by behavior of people partying at the turnout on Grizzly Peak. Big issue last year and the year before. Last year, it got to the point where there was actually a joint task force created uh, from Oakland initiated this task force and members of council, fire department were invited, our police department, UC Berkeley, uh, East Bay Regional Parks, uh, Moraga Renda, Oakland PD, Oakland Fire, all set to try to set down to try to come up with a solution. So the, an MOU, a uh, memo of understanding was created and is being signed now or vetted to be signed uh, to ensure that, at least for the police department, police powers 
are given no matter whose jurisdiction it is in. If a violation occurs, then they'll be able to give a, a citation. All the agencies uh, are patrolling these areas and have agreed to close the road on certain holidays. Uh, the group is now looking for uh, a more permanent, viable ways um, for the future of this area. Um, I, it, is, it is good to note that all agencies uh, at our last meeting noted that there was a decrease in violations uh, as the state and county opened back up after the shelter in place order. Um, so anyway, but if you hear fireworks, I know that's one of the big issues that uh, we saw on some uh, uh, questions that came in. If you hear fireworks, definitely call 911 to notify law enforcement and where, the, where they're occurring. So uh, Chief Ramon, I don't know if you want to take a few moments to answer a couple of questions. We have about three or four minutes. Yes, so most of the questions that I got were surrounding the vegetation management aspect of it. And uh, yes, we do have a program for vegetation management. Obviously, it's been a little bit understaffed for the previous years. Uh, but thanks to you, uh, this is a, definitely a program, those multiple programs that we'll be able to expand here real soon. Uh, we talked about vegetation management, uh, establishing our own vegetation management crew. Uh, and I did get some questions about incentivizing our grants for uh, private citizens uh, to assist with their vegetation management within their own household. So these are all definite programs that have come up to us. And these are all definite programs that I'm looking forward to be able to engage in starting some of these programs. Uh, we know that there's no one fix for everything. And we also know that enforcement is not, not for everybody. Uh, we also know that a lot of folks out there that own private property want to help. Uh, but sometimes because they don't have resources, there are just, there's multiple reasons why they can't do it. Uh, so we're looking at the, what resources can the fire department provide uh, to be able to get our overall objective of making, uh, making it safer here in the city of Berkeley. Uh, so we're looking at that. Uh, we're looking at partnering with uh, multiple, uh, with once again, our partners at uh, Parks and Rec, which we have uh, in the last three years, we've been able to secure a fairly significant amount of funding to be able to take some of that, the, the vegetation down also. Um, in looking forward at this, I also uh, understand that this isn't a seasonal problem. As we look at climate change and look at climate change as we're looking forward, we need to here at the Berkeley Fire Department be able to have a long standing plan that encompasses a three, five, 10, 20 year plan as we see climate change. Uh, I know Chief Thiel will uh, be taught speaking about the tree mortality, but that's gonna be a real big consideration as we move forward. Most of the trees, as you drive around, you'll see single trees that are dried out and, and, and ready to be taken down. And they're isolated trees, but they're per, fairly big trees. So imagine to get the logistics and financials to be able to get that tree out, that's going to be a huge uh, load, uh, but this is where we want to be able to step in there and be able to assist uh, both on city property and private property to assist and figure out the ways to be able to do this with the overall objective, knowing that climate change is happening, to have that plan forward of it and be able to address those issues as they come and address those issues that we know that are going to come uh, in, in front of us here. So this is what uh, this is the part that I'm really like excited about is to be able to have those programs in place and have people working full time on those specific problems. This problem up on the hill is not gonna go away overnight. And then we need people to be focused solely on that, making our community safe uh, and to be able to be able to encounter that. So that's that's what I have for uh, most of the overall type of uh, overall problem, overall questions that I had uh, given to me by the town home. Let me see if there's any other ones here, but. Uh, most of them had to deal around uh, thinning and that uh, that sort of stuff in specific problems, but generally speaking, that it was about vegetation management. Uh, <clears throat> Deputy Chief May, do you have anything to add at this time, or oh, I think that's it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, let me turn on my camera here. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, just an extraordinary amount of information and um, I very, very much appreciate all of the work that you're doing to keep Berkeley safe. Um, and now I think we'll move on to uh, the presentation from East Bay Regional Parks from Fire Chief Aileen Tiley. 
Hi, thank you very much, um, Councilwoman Wengraf, for, for having me and City of Berkeley. Thank you for, for inviting me to, to this town hall meeting. Um, I think this is the third time I've done this. Um, so some of you attendees may have heard this before, but I'm gonna give you just a brief overview of the park district and their fire hazard reduction program. Each year, the park district thins and removes vegetation within all parks to reduce fire dangers. This includes clearing heavy underbrush, uh, thinning dense forests and removing hazardous trees. In 2019, the park district added a 12 person fire hazard reduction crew dedicated to, year, to the year around decrease in fire fuels in, in the parks, um, as well as adding two additional positions uh, that, that are what's called fuels reduction coordinators to assist with larger fuel reduction projects. Grazing animals are also a tool that we use. Um, they help keep the grasses and other potential fuels in check. About 65% of the district, um, which is over two counties at about 123,000 acres, um, is grazed by upwards of 6,000 cattle, 1,500 sheep approximately, and about 1,600 goats. And that's spread over about half the district's parks at any given time. All of this work though goes hand in hand with monitoring effects on habitat and wildlife populations because we are a resource agency. The park district also has partners um, within the communities such as local and state agencies, Berkeley Fire Department, the city of Berkeley being one of them, um, and also other major landowners like East Bay Municipal uh, Utilities District. With that, we also have specialized wildland equipment. We have five remote, water, uh, remote weather stations. The, the acronym for that is ROS stations. Um, and they're located right within our parks. And they also monitor um, the weather in the district. So they're also part of a 10 ROS station program in Alameda and Contra Costa County. So next slide, please. I wanna talk, whoops, go back one, there you go, thank you. I wanna talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, Keith, Keith May and, and um, Chief Ramon both talked about uh, the Oakland Hills fire. That really prompted uh, the park district to start rather early in um, understanding that we really needed what we now have today, which is our wildfire hazard reduction and resource management plan. And this is just a little bit of a timeline to show you how long we've been working on it. And there are some high points here. In 2004, we had the passage of Measure CC, which helped fund our program. In 2010, um, our CEQA and EIR is, was completed, uh, but then it took another eight years for us to get the environmental clearance to be able to do some of the work that we needed to do. In 2018, um, we were sued uh, by two different parties. Um, and I, that was, that was kind of a tumultuous year, but it turned out uh, that we were allowed to move forward um, with our plan and implement it. And that's what we've done. Um, and we also are in 2021 participating because again, we are a resource agency um, in whip snake mitigation to help to meet some of those um, environmental permits that were put in place. Next slide. And this slide is just really to show you how much money we've spent over the last 10 years, um, $20.5 million in the last two years, or I'm sorry, last 10 years. Uh, last year was a little bit rough year for everyone because um, COVID-19 really shut down a lot of things. We still managed to get uh, $2.3 million spent specifically in vegetation management. And this is just something to show you our funding sources. Uh, we're very good at getting grants um, and collaborating and trying to use other um, other folks' money, other entities' monies make our money go a little bit further. It's been a good strategy for us because um, as it's been mentioned, um, money is definitely a factor in trying to get this fuel reduced. Next slide, please. While we were implementing our wildfire um, hazard program, um, with boots on the ground, we quickly started discovering back in um, 2020, October, that really we have a we had a larger problem, and we like to call this an incident within an incident. So we already have fuels management and this big program that we've put in play um, that is really built on perpetuity. In other words, it's not just go in and manage the fuels one and done. Um, our plan plans out for twenty plus years so that we can go in and continue to maintain the vegetation because, as we know, vegetation grows back. So. 
in October of 2020, the East Bay Regional Park District um, realized we were being impacted quite heavily by a sudden onset of tree mortality and dieback. And it was primarily affecting the eucalyptus, the acacia, bay, pine, and then some other mixed vegetation. The problem was that at the, at the time that this was leading to an increase in dead standing and highly dangerous tree species right in the middle of the wildland urban interface. So we wanted to try to figure out what was happening. Primarily, uh, what we were finding is the most significant areas of impact were in Anthony Chabot um, and in Redwood Regional Park, which is Oakland, but then also in Tilden Regional Park, which affects um, Oakland and Berkeley. Many of the impacted areas are in old eucalyptus plantations that the park district didn't plant, but we now have to deal with um, that have a high uh, tree per capita fuel loading. So a lot of eucalyptus trees densely packed. At this point, the cause of the mortality is not fully known. It likely has a direct correlation with everything that's been talking about by the prior chiefs, which is climate change and the lack of, of rain that we've had. Uh, the East Bay Regional Park District Fire Department and Stewardship Department at this point are currently partnering with the U.S. Forest Service uh, UC Berkeley, specifically um, the Mateo Garbaletto Lab, um, and CAL FIRE Resource Management in Sacramento to study the cause. Um, and next slide, please. This just gives you a little bit of, of an idea where we're being hit the hardest um, with over 600 acres in Anthony Chabot, but really totaling over 1,000 acres that are primarily in what's called SRA, which is state response area. So we've got about 1,000 acres. And um, I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing for me to say here is that this is a regional issue, which is why we've reached out to all these other partners. It's not just an issue for East Bay Regional Park District. East Bay Mud is also experiencing this. Um, City of Oakland is, and as you heard Chief Ramon say, uh, it's also starting to show up in Berkeley. Really though, um, in some of our task forces and relationships we have outside of the Bay Area, they're also starting to see it up in Marin, um, and down south. So that just points primarily the fact that it is drought, stress, and drought related. There are pathogens out there that are endemic to this area that will affect some of those trees, but we're finding, um, at least in the early research, that uh, it's a different pathogen. It's not always the same pathogen, which is makes sense uh, when you talk about science, because when a tree becomes drought stressed, what usually happens is um, the most present um, or prolific pathogen at the time will take over and kill the tree. Next slide. So what do we know? What we know is that the situation is very dynamic and it's still evolving. Um, I, it's likely that we're going to see more tree die off. In the beginning of this, we were mapping it every two weeks. And as the winter left and spring showed up and we still didn't have any rain, uh, these areas got bigger and bigger, so still evolving. Um, it's clearly a regional distribution throughout Contra Costa and Alameda County and likely in the remaining Bay Areas. It's primarily affecting the old growth eucalyptus forests, black acacia, but not some of the other acacias, Monterey pine, uh, bay laurel, and other brush species. Um, many of the impacted areas um, that are already identified for us are already in our wildfire hazard reduction and resource management planned areas. So um, while we don't necessarily have the money to be able to take down all these trees, and that's why we applied for a bunch of grants, um, we do have the environmental clearance in most areas. Next slide, please. What we've done, here is, a, here is a, uh, an example of a standing, of a standing eucalyptus that is dead. We figured out that no action is really not an option. Um, we have flown and mapped the, the extent and performed ground recognizance. We formed an EBRPD uh, multi-divisional tree mortality test force within. So we've got our stewardship department, our fire department and our operations department all working closely and collaborating. We've also formed regional uh, relationships with federal, state and local governments. And we are continuing um, to plan our initial treatment and maintenance work throughout the park district uh, within the realm of the plan that we, that we already have in place. Next slide, please. I wanted to give everybody um, an example of the work that we're already doing. And I feel like this is important because though the tree die off 
um, is the incident within the larger incident, um, we're really set up better than we would have been if we didn't have a plan already in place. So in other words, a lot of these areas that we're seeing um, tree die off, uh, we have done some work already. And I think this is the kind of, this is the direction that we're all going to have to go um, to really trying to keep our forests as resilient and as healthy as we possibly can um, because climate change is here, it's not going away and we're gonna have to manage it as best we can. So this is what we call our Grizzly Peak Strategic Ridgeline Fuel Break. Um, I know the map is not the best, but basically where Golf Links Road, or I'm sorry, Golf Course Road comes up and meets um, Grizzly Peak Boulevard, we have created a fuel break. <clears throat> it's not fully connected in all places. We have a three mile, a three mile fuel break um, that's completely been done. We might have like a half an acre over here or um, two acres down the road that haven't been completely done. And that's a usually because we've have a, we have a resource issue there. Um, but these are major entry areas where we've gone in and taking down lots of trees and lots of ladder fuels. And ladder fuels are a very important thing and what will help keep us resilient and make these fires um, survivable. And what I mean by that is we don't have any um, notion that we're going to be able to stop human caused fires, um, but we can make those fires more survivable and less catastrophic by removing some of the fuels that can help create those conflagrations. So next slide, please. So here's an example up along Grizzly Peak of work that we've done. On the left, you can see that there hasn't been any management in there. You can't see um, through the canopy of the eucalyptus there. And that's primarily because that canopy has really closed off and those trees are really close together. Um, why is that a big deal? We don't, fire departments don't want fires to go from the grasses up into the shrubs and then take another step up into the tree canopies. We don't wanna do that because we don't want to get any kind of embers aloft on the wind. And the best way to get that is during a north wind event, we have winds that'll pick up those embers off of those tree canopies and will then blow them further down the line um, in the same wind direction and start spot fires way out ahead. That's what's happened in a lot of those devastating fires that Chief May was talking about. And that's what we're trying to avoid. If we can keep it out of the tree canopies and keep it on the ground, it's a lot safer for the firefighters to fight. It's a lot smaller fire and it's way more manageable. Next slide. Here's another example um, of part of that fuel break. On the left-hand side, again, you can see grass that can burn up into the shrubs, that they can burn into, up into the trees. A lot of the trees that we're thinning and taking out are eucalyptus and pine, though not all. Um, there are some smaller shrubs that we take out. The problem with pine trees is that um, they don't have a very long lifespan. Um, their lifespan is a lot less than a lot of other of our native trees, um, and they do create a lot of debris on the ground in their pine needles. Um, so as you start to see these trees um, turn brown, um, those are the ones that are dead and dying and that we need to take out. Um, and we really try to keep the brush that's underneath those eucalyptus down and removed. What we want is exactly what you see on the right, where if a fire started on the side of the road, yes, it could burn through the grasses that are there, um, but it's not going to get up into the tree canopies. We remove those middle rungs of the ladder. Next slide. So this is what we do. Um, and the slide, is the, the slide is titled what we do because this is really what we've been doing even prior to this tree die off. Um, we are continuing to go in, we're continuing to remove those ladder fuels. Um, and we're looking at long-term and short-term things that we need. We're taking a good look at it. Like, um, you know, in the, in the short term, we need to have these kinds of meetings with with our constituents so they understand what we're doing and they can help support it. Long-term, we need to look for long-term funding um, so that we can continue to do this. Uh, we spend a lot of our own money as well as the grant money that we have to fund um, these you know, millions of dollars uh, every year to try to remove this fuel. Um, we've increased our on-call contracting. Um, we're looking for, we were looking to increase our staffing. I mentioned earlier that we added 
uh, 12 new positions in, in 2019, and we'll probably be asking for another um, few positions this next coming year. And then the increased staffing is really to help us manage short-term and, and long-term workloads. Over and above that, um, we're seeking um, funding from both the state um, and the feds. Next slide, please. So that's what the fire department has been doing and the district, but really um, one of the things that, that our government affairs folks are doing and that our board of directors is supporting us in is really trying to, to tap into some of the resources at the state level with regard to forest health. Um, we're trying to get in early as the state budget is, is coming down um, to help both promote fire or wildfire prevention, um, but also trying to get some of those monies um, because we are shovel ready. We have this program already in place. We have the personnel in place um, and we can do it. We've also met with a uh, with Chief Porter of Cal, of Cal Fire um, and a Natural Resource Agency for California to try to get them to, to know who we are, let them know we're a major landowner. Um, we're right smack dab in the wildland urban interface and we really need their help and support. Um, we've shared what our budgeting needs are and made it very clear that, um, well, what I just said, we're shovel ready and uh, we need their support. And then also we're trying to support any kind of um, green tape initiative that helps us get through that. Uh, the North Orinda fuel break last year is a great example of that. That was two years ago now, um, where the state, the governor waived CEQA, which was very helpful um, for part of the work that we need to do. We are a resource agency. We keep parks for people into perpetuity. And so we have a lot of different resources, some of them federal, uh, that we really have to be protective of as well. So um, we understand that we wanna keep these resources safe, but we still have fuels reduction work to do in an effort to keep um, the communities that we serve safe. Next slide. And here is an unfortunate uh, picture. You can see kind of the, looks like almost a dirty brown pastel. Um, and that is the eucalyptus groves and Anthony Chabot that have been affected. Um, I really appreciate Chief May and Chief um, Roman talking about um, the interop interoperability that we share with them in Oakland. Um, in fact, we'll be meeting soon to talk about our program, um, share some strategies for expanding our programs. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you all tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chief Tiley. Um, you are our, uh, our neighbor, and we very much appreciate um, all of the efforts that you have made uh, to work with us, um, to listen to our concerns, um, and to respond to them as well. And, and moving forward, we, we have a big problem, uh, but it's a shared problem, and I hope that we can continue our uh, cooperative uh, efforts um, to deal with it. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you can, if you can stay on uh, till the close of the program, we may have some questions. And I just want to, I, I want to make sure that, that you announced about the controlled burn that's going to happen. Did you talk about that? I did not. Uh, as with prescribed burns, they need to be in prescription. Um, we will have actually um, a, an engine from Berkeley there. It is scheduled as long as the weather stays in prescription. It is scheduled for Monday, the 24th. It's a very small plot. It's 2.5 acres, um, but it's a, strate a strategic spot. Um, and we're it's kind of a, it's one of those things where we're trying to, to let people um, understand and pay attention to the fact that uh, there are options to having these catastrophic wildland fires where we've got 13 days of the worst air on the planet, which is what we had um, even worse than Beijing, so in the Bay Area. Um, and instead of having those kinds of things, we can use all the tools, grazing animals, our fuels reduction program, um, but also prescribed fire to come in and do very small, very specific, and um, very thoughtful burns where we don't put a lot of smoke in the air, um, it's in prescription, 
it's always better to have something that is planned and prepared for um, than to do nothing and have something that is not and is much more dangerous. So um, we're hoping to have the fire. However, the weather may not cooperate. Uh, we do need to have brown grass to burn and currently it's very green. So more to come on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll move on to a presentation from Captain um, Beckman from Cal Fire about what you can be doing to organize your neighborhoods to be firewise. Thank you, uh, Captain Beckman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Wengraff. Um, I appreciate the invitation to speak to the constituents of Berkeley. Um, also, my appreciations to uh, Chief Roman, uh, Chief May, as well as Chief Eileen. Uh, tough act to follow, but a lot of fantastic information that they've been able to provide. And I may touch on a few of the, the same uh, highlights and points, but the message is definitely unified. And so with that being said, uh, can we go ahead and start the presentation, please? So I am here. Um, on behalf of CAL FIRE, um, I work for the agency as well as uh, my assignment is with the land use planning program. I have uh, jurisdictional responsibilities as uh, your regional coordinator when it comes to FIREWISE. And I am having trouble seeing the slide. work a few seconds to get that back up and running. But uh, just as an introduction, um, again, I've been with CAL FIRE for about 25 years. Uh, this is my 25th fire season. And as Chief May indicated, it's more of a fire year now. Um, and the key to success uh, with, with firefighting, whether it's suppression, um, whether it's with hand crews, aviation, whether it's in uh, doing investigation work or inspection work, um, it's being prepared. And that's when prevention comes into the equation. Um, and that is what Firewise uh, really holds near and dear to its heart. And I'm still having trouble with the slide. Can anybody else uh, see the screen that is uh, being shown right now? Any of the other panelists? Yes, I can see it. Interesting. So I'm seeing a blurred out. It just says Firewise. Let's let's try the next one. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Now it populated. I'm seeing training for the city of Berkeley and its citizens. That's why I'm here. Next slide, please. So as it's been mentioned, uh, the climate in California has always been conducive uh, to wildfire. And to better prepare and become more resilient, uh, CAL FIRE and NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association, uh, have partnered to spread the meaningful message of preventative work. Um, and specifically, the FireWise group is a grassroots organization that uh, really solicits full community involvement. And at that point, the communities can come together and prepare for the inevitable wildfire uh, year in California. Uh, next slide, please. So a few things that uh, we'll discuss tonight. Uh, I found it very uh, educational to do a little bit of review on the fire history within uh, the city of Berkeley and the surrounding uh, jurisdictions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit on a more uh, elevated platform of the regional coordinators and the folks that I have to uh, work for and work with. Um, I'll touch a little bit on what's known as the fire hazard severity zones. And um, 
Chief May uh, talked about zones within Berkeley, and I'm going to just extend that a little bit into uh, what the fire hazard severity zones are and where the community of Berkeley uh, falls in that. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the external factors and the internal fa factors that will affect the fire threat. And then uh, to get into the bulk of the presentation, we'll talk about the FireWise program overview and how it applies to you and the city of Berkeley. Next slide, please. So we've talked about uh, the fire of 1923, um, known as the day that Berkeley burned. Um, by 2 p.m., everybody had really started to take note of the uncommonly warm, dry wind. And uh, just over the hill in our neighbors, uh, or with our neighbors in the East Bay Regional Park District, there was a small grass fire that started in uh, Wildcat Canyon. And with those Diablo winds that were starting to push and uh, extend themselves, that fire started to leap and make its way and crest down into the hills of North Berkeley. Uh, when it finally did, near Berryman Reservoir, the fire was a half a mile wide and the fire raged down Cadornis' Creek and tore down on the north side neighborhood that ran from the creek to the northern edge of the Berkeley campus. And mind you, at that point, there was a lot of uh, great architecture and prominent uh, home building uh, that was taking place in that part of Berkeley. Uh, and that final tally, more than 500 homes were destroyed. Um, thankfully, no one was killed, but we had uh, plenty of displacement. Uh, and then again, we talked about the 1991 uh, East Bay Hills incident, and we weren't as lucky as we experienced 25 fatalities and destroyed more than 3,000 homes. And again, um, both fires occurred on these unseasonally warm, dry fall days, uh, propelled by the winds known as the Diablo winds. Next slide, please. Like I mentioned, uh, some of the FireWise regional coordinators, um, I have just this uh, slide here for you all to see. Uh, my direct supervisor is Battalion Chief Nick Wallingford, who also assumes some of the regional efforts uh, more in the uh, northern part of California. And by northern, I mean from uh, Bay Area North. And then my main chief is Matt Damon, who I deal with directly when it comes to applications. Um, I tend to be more boots on the ground when it comes to the education and outreach with the communities. And then once these packages get submitted to FireWise, FireWise will then, or excuse me, NFPA will then uh, relay that information down to Chief Damon and he then goes through the approval process. Next slide, please. Uh, there is a basic problem and it's been addressed uh, thoroughly by everybody out here and, or excuse me, on this panel tonight. And it's, to put it simple, is that we are surrounded by heavy forests that are dry, that are dying, um, that are being impacted by folks building into the WUI or the wildland urban interface. Um, climate change is happening and our annual dry spells are increasing and the fire danger is uh, intensifying because of that, even when there is no drought. And as mentioned as well, there's uh, several sources of ignition that cause fires, but both lightning and human caused fires uh, tend to be the predominant source in our area. Next slide, please. So I'd like to uh, talk about the fire hazard severity zone maps. Um, so this map was generated uh, back in 2007 and the fire hazard severity zone maps are being uh, worked on right now. And it's a long standing process and everybody is really curious as to when uh, these will be released. But in, in essence, there are three zones that are uh, created or at least identified when these zones are being prepared. One is moderate. Uh, the second is a high fire hazard severity zone. And then the third would be a very high fire hazard severity zone. 
And so I took this uh, photo uh, from the FRAP website and highlighted Berkeley. And as you can see, the area on the right-hand side that's highlighted in red, which would be your east side, uh, Berkeley Hills that backs up against the uh, East Bay Regional Park, Tilden Park, uh, uh, Grizzly Peak, is highlighted in red. And that is what we consider a very high fire hazard severity zone. Uh, that has been illustrated um, several times by the other chief officers. And I just wanna make sure that it's relayed that the state also recognizes the potential and how uh, uh, catastrophic and, and severe the conditions are in that area and to its constituents. The next slide, please. Following it up, um, you could, I, I didn't put any type of uh, editing into this, but I just wanted to overall show kind of where that zone would, would fall. And basically where you see the Tilden Regional Park uh, that comes down through Shasta Road and along Grizzly Peak Boulevard, down south into the, the university, uh, as well as the University of California Botanical Garden, that is all considered the very high fire hazard severity zone. But as I, you know, look at this map and I reference some landmarks uh, of familiarity, uh, specifically uh, Cadornis's Park, um, North Berkeley, um, the Indian Rock Park, I am reminded of an incident that uh, I responded to and um, is still very much a reality, which was the fire up in Santa Rosa. Uh, it was mentioned the Tubbs fire and Coffee Park specifically was your uh, suburban community, uh, similar to what we have here. And so as Chief May had indicated, because we are not necessarily in an area that's heavy forested or with significant vegetation or ladder fuels. We're not um, out of the woods, so to speak, when we are uh, applying the fire risk and its uh, effect on the suburban community as well. Next slide, please. And so with that, we talk about the external fire threat and, you know, there's no set path of destruction or path that a fire takes. And that's the science behind it. Um, we know that this can uh, develop from any direction um, and, and a lot of different fuel models, um, especially our one hour fuels, which are your, your fine fuels, your grasses, your needles, your leaf litter, um, which is what's going to be the most susceptible to fire and fire growth. And so we have that model in our, in our area of Berkeley, as well as the oak woodland with the intermix uh, timber to the north, south, and east. Uh, the various topographic features within our region, um, you know, we have the funneling of creek drainages and the on and offshore wind influences. So I just don't want anybody to be misled that these various grasslands that border our community are uh, not susceptible to fire because uh, it was also mentioned that the ember cast or you'll hear it as fire brands, but that's the major study that's being done right now in relation to the California Fire Code, specifically chapter 7A and, and how we are going to protect ourselves from the ember blizzard that can reach uh, well ahead of the flame front um, when we're dealing with whether uh, that is conducive and supports that, as well as the vegetation. Um, if you could go back uh, to that last slide, I just wanted to highlight the campfire that burned up in paradise, uh, burned at 300 yards, 300 yards a second. And without having a very good reference into Berkeley, from Wildcat Canyon, if we were to experience a start in uh, East Bay Regional Park to the Cadornis's Park is 3,500 yards. Um, so that basically lets us know that from that point to uh, the Cadornis's Park, the folks within that area would have a 12 second time frame to evacuate. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this photo just illustrates uh, what the ember blizzard looks like, as we saw in the uh, Oakland Hills video, just a, a gazillion particles uh, flying that can stay aloft uh, upwards of a mile and still produce um, a spot fire or um, an ignition source. Next slide, please. The internal fire threat is obviously what we are doing as citizens and uh, homeowners that live within the WUI. So not only are we considering the natural fuels, but we need to also consider uh, what we introduce into our environment. Um, so it's a combination of both the external and the internal. So it's extremely important to um, kind of keep in mind the idea of suate, which is an old school term that I learned uh, as a young fireman. But when, we, when we're looking at our communities, how do we want to assess our specific home as well as the area that we live in or the neighborhood, et cetera. So it's important to take a look at the structure itself or uh, structures, you know, whether it be um, an ADU or a, uh, a shed, whatever the case may be, but we want to start our assessments and work from the top down. Um, that's also true to our utilities, propane, septic, um power lines and what does the vegetation uh, management look like in those areas as well um, access um, how do our roads um, i know that living in the east bay area myself that the roads are are steep that they're narrow that they're overgrown and we have a, um, a shortage of of dollars and personnel that can actually go out there and maintain all of these roads. It's, it's a daunting task when we actually take a look at all of the uh, roadways within our um, greater Bay Area, but specifically to uh, communities and neighborhoods, how can we minimize the effect of uh, vegetation and, and allow for better egress and ingress and evacuation? We also need to take a look at the topography and, and where we are uh, living, right? If we are on top of a hill or the lee side of a ridge adjacent to a drainage. Um, so the topography obviously is, is very important to take into consideration uh, when preparing your home um, as to how the fire uh, will respond to the topo topographic changes. And then lastly, um, evacuations. Um, you know, there's been a lot of mention uh, by the city of Berkeley's fire department uh, with the measures that are being taken. So I don't want to speak to that, but I think it's fantastic. Um, and I actually was extremely impressed with um, some of the new things as far as the uh, zone haven evacuation platform. Um, it's just a great um, opportunity to learn something new, too. So thank you for that. Next slide. Um, I don't think this is a, a very accurate, um, you know, it's not, I, it makes us feel um, less than when I say reality check, because we are all too familiar with fires in our area. And we all know that it's not a matter of when it, it's a matter of, uh, of where it's going to happen next. Um, we've been tasked. Uh, the fire agencies, CAL FIRE, the Forest Service, the local uh, city and local government departments. And we've seen that when we have these major incidents, they, for whatever reason, all happen at the same time. And it's because of the weather patterns. And so now everybody gets extremely spread out and is trying to take care of their own. And when we experience those major fires, we do not have enough fire suppression resources available to uh, mitigate the emergency. And that's where we can, as homeowners, have a grassroots approach um, and influence on determining how we can survive a major wildland incident. Next slide, please. So again, uh, now I'm gonna kind of dovetail back into the, the meat and potatoes of the program. Uh, this is a self-directed self-help program to make improvements within uh, your communities or your developments. Um, there is a criteria that uh, needs to be met. So basically more than eight homes 
If you have more than eight homes, you uh, can apply to be a recognized FireWise site and no more than 2,500 homes. Um, if you start looking at a process where you're looking at more than 2,500 homes within, let's just say for uh, ease, a zone, um, then you would have to split that uh, zone uh, per FireWise. Um, it's uh, full community involvement. Um, it starts with a community evaluation and you're really assessing your community for the strengths and weaknesses. Um, as mentioned, you know, there's a lot of, of preventative work that's being done when it comes to fuel breaks and, and fuel reduction or, or home hardening, um, looking at the, the topography and, and the traditional wind directions and, and what are we have in place right now as it stands to bolster up um, a wildfire if it was to approach from this side. So, so taking a, a directional approach, a four prong approach, and not just looking at your home, but coming up above at the 30,000 foot level and looking at the box of your community and, and looking at uh, what can be looked at as a success or area of improvement. And then once you, you know, that make those evaluations and determinations then you decide how you like to go about it and that is laying out a, a three-year plan that has to be a deliverable action um, with deliverable action items that reflect um, what the intent is over the course of three years so if it was to start today you would uh, illustrate the 2021 season through 2023 year excuse me not season Next slide, please. So what are the incentives? What, what are the, uh, why, why do we wanna do this? Well, as homeowners, um, we have a lot of pride. As community members, we have a lot of pride and, and safety is paramount. Um, and so if we're not out there engaged with our community right now, or, or looking at how we are vulnerable, now we're gonna gain some insight into our community risks just by getting involved and making ourselves available and almost admitting to not being educated. So we have to be very humble and uh, approach this with a lot of seriousness and, and that the risk is extreme. Um, it, it improves our awareness of fire safety issues and good practices. Um, a lot of public education is already being done um, at the city level, uh, and we know that, as well as the, the county level and, and, and the surrounding partnerships that we have. So the improving the awareness and, and integrating the community with the fire agencies is nothing but good. It, there's nothing that bad that can come from that because now we are um, in our preparedness um, we're becoming more professional as even homeowners in the knowledge that's being shared and the working relationships that are forged with our local entities. Um, we also now are working towards reduced fire risks. That's the, the number one key. Um, we're beautifying our neighborhoods. We're creating a more healthy, thriving uh, forest that surrounds us or that we live within. Um, obviously creating more fire resistance, fire, fire tolerant neighborhood, and reducing the hazards to our own property as well as our neighbors. And then um, lastly, demonstrating our commitment to the insurance carriers and others. Um, you know, the grant talks have, have definitely happened and, and are continuously happening. Um, I can't speak or I will not speak to the time frames on grants, but there definitely is a source uh, for grants when it comes to mitigation grants through Cal OES. Um, and then a big one is that the insurance premiums may be reduced. Um, I do not work for an insurance agency, but I do know that USAA as well as Mercury are working and integrating themselves with NFPA and Firewise. Next slide, please. So the initial process, uh, we, we, I kind of talked about that a little bit already, but the first thing that we will do is, is uh, I will be made, or I, I will be put into contact with, with you folks. 
and I will provide you with a lot of documentation. And one of those uh, first pieces of documentation is a uh, assessment document. And the assessment document is absolutely required by NFPA. Um, anything else that is submitted on behalf of the neighborhood or community would be supplemental. Um, but that standard NFPA FireWise risk assessment uh, is required. Uh, and then what you do is you, you form a FireWise board and committee. Um, interested bodies come together and, and decide that they want to do this. Like I mentioned, you would prepare an action plan uh, that is a deliverable um, three-year plan that has identified uh, a number of items that you're in that your community wishes to address. Um, and then you take action. You complete, a one, you complete one educational outreach event and you complete a wildfire risk reduction in your community. So getting out and deciding that we want to open up our roads or we, we're gonna start on these 10 homes and start from the top to the bottom and re remove all the leaf litter and, and harden up our vents and um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then lastly, you would submit your certification application online at the FireWise portal. All of these documents and processes would be provided to you and or um, I can forward them to any council member um, on your behalf. Next slide, please. Um, this is a free organization. It doesn't cost our constituent anything. Um, you know, there's opportunity, as mentioned, where you will receive assistance uh, with a fire professional um, on your evaluation, which really solicits interest. Um, it's, it's hard to make ourselves available all of the time because we have so many things uh, that we have going on with our professional lives. And, and this is just another one of those things. But um, I, I definitely try to make myself available to assist with the community evaluation. And I know that um, our partners with Alameda County Fire, um, as well as, as Berkeley Fire, uh, East Bay Regional Park District would definitely entertain that as well. Um, all of the documentation is, is done by your board and your community members that decide to embark on this endeavor. And the investment that needs to be met is is very simple and with a lot of ease if you ask a, a homeowner um, but a dwelling is a single family home cabin mobile home or an apartment and one hour is required annually as your investment um, into firewise and that one hour constitutes 25 hour or excuse me 25 dollars um, in the eyes of nfpa and it's, it's, it's very easy to, you know, I can mow my lawn in an hour. Next slide, please. And now to maintain our certification, uh, we're required uh, some annual FireWise activities, um, holding a FireWise day, which is an educational outreach event that targets your community and or your surrounding communities to uh, let them know what you're doing as a community and solicit interest from other communities because there really is um, so many surrounding communities that are interwoven with one another that network and reach out and, and create dialogue and, and get their answers or their questions out because a lot of us have the same questions and the how to's and where can I's. Um, so with your educational outreach event, a lot of that um, is met. And then like I mentioned with the uh, investments, uh, one hour per dwelling, and then the renewal, oh, that, that's in there a couple of times. I'm sorry for this duplicate, but you submit online through the FireWise portal. Next slide, please. And lastly, this is all too familiar. Um, you know, we've seen these major incidents in, in Napa County, in, in, uh, in Oakland, in Berkeley, um, Lake County, Butte County, where we are not immune to this type of incident right here. And so you don't wanna be a victim and let this do this to your community. And it's a very grim reminder that we are at the front of fire season. 
and it just takes one spark in alignment with our weather and the fuel and we have this and if i can be available and assist you and the constituents of berkeley to prevent this at the smallest level that's my job i want to Thank you all for your time and attention and uh, feel free to reach out to me. And, and if we go to the next slide. As mentioned, we can, uh, here's some contact information right here. Um, so if you have your phone, um, go ahead and take a screenshot of that. Um, I'm available Tuesday through Friday, most weeks. Um, if I am not available, I will do my due diligence in responding back to you and assisting you and the constituent of Berkeley in becoming Firewise. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Captain um, Beckman. This, this was uh, a incredible. And this is the first time that we have had a presentation in Berkeley on uh, forming a firewise community. So um, I just wanna say that um, uh, I will help, I will help neighborhoods uh, organize and I'm sure that my colleagues, council member Han and council member Drosty feel the same way. I think that this is critical. Uh, this kind of organizational structure uh, is critical. Uh, to us getting ahead of the curve on fire safety. So thank you again, Captain Beckman, very, very much. Um, we're running a little late, we're 10 minutes over, but um, I, I want to, um, I just wanna say um, there was a lot of information tonight. Um, I feel like it was very informative and very educational. And I'm sure that all of you, and by the way, uh, we had way more than 200 uh, attendees uh, on the meeting. Um, all of you have many questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able uh, to address those questions right now. But as I said earlier, please write your council members with your questions um, and we will work together. Council Member Han and Council Member Drosty and I will work together uh, with our fire department to get those questions answered. We did have um, we did have two, some, uh, several questions about underground and utilities, which we did not address. And I just want to say, I have been working uh, with the support of Council Member Hahn and Council Member Drosty and the mayor on undergrounding. In 2015, we formed an undergrounding task force. They did phenomenal work. They were all volunteers. Um, there are three phases to their report that are available on the website. If you go to the city, and, and put in undergrounding task force, you will, uh, there is an undergrounding page and you can access the work they did. That said, uh, the CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission, which oversees uh, the utility companies has um, basically um, put undergrounding the, the rule 20 program on hold for the moment. And we are waiting for a final decision from, for, from them about whether or not um, we will have the ability to underground um, uh, in the future. Um, we do have 20B programs, which can be financed by the residents themselves, but that too is sort of in limbo right now. So, what I can say is um, probably by the summer, well, we're in May already, but perhaps by September, we will have a final determination from the CPUC about how we can move forward with undergrounding. Um, I think the entire council, city council, joins me in understanding that this is a critical element to fire safety and to safe evacuation. But without the um, cooperation of PG&E and the CPUC, um, it's very, very difficult for us to move forward. Um, so that's not a great note to end with, but 
Um, I wanna thank you all again for attending. Um, we will be doing this again. Um, as uh, Deputy Chief May said, they're gonna be rolling out the zone haven evacuation information in a matter of weeks. And um, so stay tuned. We have a lot, uh, a lot going on. And also I wanna remind you that the CHIPPER program will be starting in uh, two weeks. Uh, you should have gotten your green brochure in the mail. Please, please take advantage of that program to limb up your trees, um, cut off your branches and, and put them in the street. This is a program that the city provides to you at no cost and um, at no cost to you, uh, great cost to the city, but no cost to you. And um, I, I really encourage you to take advantage. There are two runs. If you don't have that green brochure, you can go online to the city website um, and, um, and find the schedule. Uh, I also have it in my newsletter and I will be posted in my newsletter uh, the next, next time I send one out. Um, there's also a, a debris bin program, which you can take advantage of. And um, these are services that we provide to you to help you clear your yards um, and do um, measures that will improve your fire safety. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight and I uh, hope, hope you learned a lot. Um, I hope it motivates you to um, take measures on your own property uh, so that we can all be safe. Thank you and take care. Good night.